I took a trip to stay in a cabin in the middle of the woods, high up in the mountains of the city of Ranger, Georgia, United States of America. This neighborhood was 30 minutes up in the mountains, away from civilization, and even the cabins were spread far apart. The front deck of the cabin was completely exposed to the woods, so I acknowledged that any animals could stroll along if they pleased. But I stayed there for about a week, and me and my boyfriend sat outside on the front deck every night very late and at no point felt in danger. It was peaceful with fireflies out and sounds of crickets every night. Until the fifth night it was eerily dark too. The moon was covered heavily. It was about midnight and all of a sudden I didn't feel peace like I did those other nights. The forest went completely quiet and I felt a horrible sense of dread. I genuinely feared for my life. I sat there in my chair looking out into the dark forest trying to rationalize and calm myself down that it was my mind playing tricks. But all of a sudden, my boyfriend said out loud that he felt unsafe. That's when I realized it wasn't just me. We then both heard a blood-curdling scream and we pulled out a flashlight to see what it was. Turns out it was a gray fox. They make scary screaming sounds. The weird part was that the fox was running and had its ears and tail down like it was scared. This was in June, and I read that foxes scream like that when it's mating season, or if they're in danger. Their mating season is winter, and this happened in June. So I do believe this fox was in danger, or, or afraid, as well adding to our fear, the cabin has three floors. And we were able to climb out the window and sit on the roof, because we wanted to still be outside and relax. Didn't matter how high up I was, I felt something truly evil and stayed inside. The only other time I felt something so evil or like someone was watching was when I had a few paranormal experiences at a haunted house. Georgia doesn't really get mountain lions that often. Maybe a bear, but it didn't feel that way at all. It felt unnatural. I had a couple of experiences in the 1970s. I was nearly moved to what was then a fairly wooded area of Provo, Utah, on the northwest side. My mom and I lived on a main artery of town, with woods going down to the Provo River. A couple of my girlfriends from high school had spent a Saturday night at my house. That Sunday morning, we walked down to the fields and apple orchards in back of our house, which went back several acres. We had just gone between two old outbuildings and were about to open the gate to go into the orchard over the irrigation creek when all three of us heard an extremely loud growl and howl come from the building to our right. It didn't sound like a dog or have that wild, crazy cry of a coyote. It sounded to all three of us exactly like the howling of a wolf. We looked at each other and split running for the house. We were the only ones home. We locked the doors, pulled down the shades, and huddled in the living room, trying to figure out what we had heard. All three of us were experienced campers, and we had heard all sorts of animals on these trips, and many of the camping trips had been the three of us together. This sounded weird, sort of extremely loud, but yet muffled, like listening to a kid's talking into the old string and can phones. Tape recorders were cassettes or real to real at that time. There was no way someone was hiding in that building playing a tape recorder. There was no electricity to those buildings. They were boarded up and padlocked. There were no loose boards or holes, something like a big dog or even a cat could get in there. You would have needed to have an amplifier or a speaker cranked up to get that sort of volume. My mom found us sitting in the front room in the dark, and we were really hesitant to tell her what we had heard for obvious reasons. She sort of blew it off. We never did find out anything on it. The adults that we asked about it said it was our imagination. To this day, the three of us still talk about that incident. The second incident happened in 1977. I was in college then, and now living in a massive apartment complex in the southwest part of Provo. My mom and I had gone to bed around nine. 
We were both awakened at 1 a.m. to growling, whining, and that same loud, freaking howling right outside the sliding glass door in my bedroom. We could hear something large out there. It let out this blood-curdling howl almost exactly like what my friends and I had heard a few years earlier. My mom wanted to look out the window. I had two small adult dogs at the time, and they had dove under the bed, silent, and wouldn't come out for hours. I told her, don't look out the window. I didn't want to see this thing, but more to the point, I didn't want it to see us. We could hear it whining and growling, running off through the parking lot, eventually fading away. We didn't sleep that night. The next morning, I knocked on our neighbor's door and asked if they had heard a dog howling in our adjoining backyard. He said no. He'd slept peacefully. It was hard for me to believe he hadn't heard it because it had been so loud and weird. I told my mom what he had told me and she couldn't believe anyone could have slept through that. We stayed up the next night and waited. We couldn't sleep. I had since tacked down my drape, so uh, whatever it was couldn't peek in. So we drank coffee in the front room in the dark and watched the clock. Right at 1 a.m. it started again. Again the dogs froze and suddenly darted noiselessly under the table and shook. This time the whining of whatever it was almost sounded like a baby crying. There was growling and then it began to howl and Midway through the howl, it stopped suddenly, like something had startled it. We heard a rustle and loud thumping running. Again, we heard the weird baby cry and whine fade off through the grass going west. We never heard it again after that. I guess I am basically posting this experience to see if anyone has any more information as to what it was or has experienced it themselves in the Provo area. It definitely left an impression on... Us three high school friends that we're still trying to puzzle out even now in our mid-sixties. Thank you for your thoughtfulness in reading my experience. My name is Mike Halloran, a hard-boiled detective from the city. I've solved more crimes than I can count seen more things than most men would care to, but none of it prepared me for the quaint midwestern town of Maple Ridge. Maple Ridge was a place where everyone knew everyone, and an eerie hush descended on it after sundown. But a series of bizarre disappearances had thrust this quiet town into the spotlight. Unexplained disappearances of people of color had me packing up my city life and heading straight into the heartland. And as if that wasn't strange enough, each disappearance was preceded by a blackout that plunged the whole town into darkness. The night I arrived, I was welcomed by an eerie spectacle, strange lights darting in the sky. As I watched, the lights vanished, and a familiar darkness spread across the town. Then everything went blank. When I woke up, I was miles away from my initial location, and another person had disappeared. My investigation led me on a twisted path. Every lead, every piece of evidence pointed toward something out of this world, something I never believed in, alien abductions. The evidence was there, but convincing my skeptical team was another story. They laughed it off, brushed it aside, until one by one, they too started disappearing. As the team dwindled, the truth unraveled itself in a way I couldn't have imagined. It wasn't aliens, but it was far from normal. The government was orchestrating these alien abductions. They were abducting people for some sickening experiment. I was furious, disgusted. I told them I'd expose their cruel games, bring their secrets to light, but they beat me to it. Before I could make a move, I found myself locked away, cut off from the world. They thought they could silence me. They thought they could bury the truth. They were wrong. They've locked away the man. But the truth, the truth is out there, waiting to be discovered. I may be locked up, but I won't stop fighting. Because the truth, the truth never stays hidden for long. Behind the iron bars of my confinement, I could only watch as the world carried on, oblivious to the grim truth I had unearthed. But I knew I couldn't sit idly by, not while the government played God using innocent lives for their twisted experiments. 
My captors, smug in their belief that they had secured their secrets, were complacent. I, on the other hand, had spent years outsmarting the cleverest of criminals, and I wasn't about to be outdone. The concrete walls and steel bars were a challenge, but not an impossible one. Day by day, I started formulating a plan. The guards were punctual to a fault. The CTV cameras had a blind spot, and the evening meals came without fail at 7 p.m. sharp. There was a pattern, a rhythm, I could exploit. I was careful, patient. Time was a luxury I had, and I wasn't about to squander it. My chance came one rainy evening. A guard, new and inexperienced, left his post a minute too early, creating a lapse in their otherwise meticulous routine. I seized the opportunity. Using a makeshift tool I had been secretly working on, I unlocked my cell and slipped into the Keteve blind spot. I moved through the sterile corridors, my heart pounding. It felt good to be back in the field, even if the circumstances were dire. Using the guard's predictable patterns to my advantage, I made my way to the control room. Once inside, I quickly disabled the alarms and surveillance cameras. My years on the force had made me adept at navigating such systems. I was in and out in minutes, leaving no trace of my presence. With the alarms and cameras down, I had a small window of opportunity. I found the files I needed, evidence of the government's horrific experiments, and made a dash for the exit. The rain was pouring down when I emerged into the cold night. The facility was in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by miles of barren land. But I didn't mind the isolation. I was free, and I had the proof to bring them down. My fight isn't over yet. I need to get these documents to the public, let them see the truth hidden beneath the cover of alien abductions. I may be a fugitive now on the run from the very institution I once served, but I won't rest until the truth is out there. I am Mike Halloran, and I'm just getting started. I'm a 62-year-old man who has seen lots of things in my life. My mother and my grandmother were Cree natives. My mother told me one day a story from her grandmother about the Wendigo and how it related to our people. She would always warn me to beware of the Wendigo. I joined the Canadian Armed Forces when I came of age. My folks drove me to the gate to walk into my new life. My mom told me, I'm proud of you, my son. I'm sure you will do well. Just be careful when you're out in the wild. Watch for the Wendigo. After my basic training, I was sent on a tradesman course, and then to my first post. I was assigned to the Special Service Forces in Petawawa, Ontario, as a communication specialist, since my job included fixing telecommunication equipment. I had a top-secret security clearance. We trained hard when I was there and I was ready to go head to head with whatever enemy I would encounter in my missions. One day in December, we were transported via helicopter on a mountaintop close to Algonquin Provincial Park for a week of winter warfare courses. During this week of training, we each had to do guard duty at night. On one of those nights at around 2 a.m., I started hearing strange voices down the mountain. That night, the temperature was around minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. At first, I checked to see that everyone was sleeping in their tents. They were all accounted for. I scanned the area to see if I could locate someone. There was nobody there, at least no one that I could see with my military-issue flashlight. I continued hearing those voices for a while, so I decided to call out to wh whoever was there. Hello. Who goes there? You're on a Canadian Armed Forces base. Identify yourself. No answer. I kept looking for whatever might be there, but I was still hearing those voices that sounded Asian. Some came from the right, others from the left. They seemed like they were having some kind of conversation. Since it was a training and learning exercise, we had no ammo in our weapons. Not knowing what to expect, I did the second best thing I could do. I fixed the bayonet and kept walking around the camp. The voices stopped after a while. 
I was wondering who in the right mind would hike into the wilderness for at least twenty miles in such miserable weather just to pull up a prank on us. That week they closed down the base two times because it was so cold. Of course, we stayed on a mountain top. It was part of the training, they said. My replacement came after a while, and when he showed up the first thing he asked me was what I was doing with a bayonet on my weapon. I didn't want to say I was hearing voices down below us. I told him it was so cold that I decided to do some drill movements to warm myself up. I don't know if he believed me. The next month there was a huge military exercise in Wainwright, Alberta. The entire brigade ended up there. One day I was going on a call with my partner to do a repair on a piece of equipment that was out in the middle of nowhere. We had been driving for about 45 minutes in deep snow and could not find the equipment. I was driving and decided to stop and check our location to find our target. My partner was looking at a topographical map while I was trying to see if I could locate a reference point. On our right there was a forested area with pine and underbrush. On the left there was an open field. At about a hundred feet from the tree line at my ten o'clock position there was a large white-tailed buck foraging in the snow. The deer was facing us and looking out in our direction. Then, out of nowhere, a huge creature blasted out of the tree line and aimed directly toward the grazing deer. It took less time for the beast to cover the approximate 100 feet of the deer than it took for me to tell my partner to look. The beast grabbed the deer by the head. It was taller than the deer by about two feet. It was reddish, brown in color, with very wide shoulders. The head was pointed and was set on the shoulders without a neck. The arms were long and muscled. The legs were like fifty-five gallon drums and the body was covered with long hair. I wish I had more time to look at it and get more details, but everything went so fast. As soon as the beast reached the deer, it placed one hand on the top of the deer's head and the other at the back of the neck, then twisted it like it was a rag. Without even stopping it, headed back into the woods with the deer over its shoulder. I put the truck in gear and said, let's get out of here. My partner managed to find the trail leading to our destination, and we found the equipment. When we made our way back to the bivouac area, my sergeant asked me if everything went okay. I told him I don't know what I saw on our way to the other location, but it was pretty freaky. He looked at me and said that he didn't want to hear about it, so I kept it to myself, and I walked away. As time went on, and as I grew older, I realized that I had witnessed a Sasquatch harvest that deer. I had a nice career in the Army. I did some missions and went on several in peacekeeping missions throughout the world. I saw a lot of strange animals and witnessed many unusual situations. But that beast in Alberta was the one that I will never forget. I've lived in Idaho all my life and spent a lot of time outside or in the wilderness as a kid. My grandparents would take me camping and my older brother and I would always hike up whatever trail we could find to get a view of the sunset. On one of these occasions, something terrifying happened. We were up at a campsite I only know as Warm River. The river there never freezes over, and my brother and I were on a regular evening hike. There was an old tunnel bored through the mountain at one part of the trail, probably an old train tunnel, and we were walking through it when I heard something I'll never forget. After walking through probably two-thirds of the way through the tunnel, I heard a terrible screech at the end we entered through. The screech wasn't like anything I'd heard before. I've heard the screams of animals on dark and windy nights. I even think I've heard Bigfoot calls a few times, but never the metallic grinding screech I heard that day. The point is, whatever the sound was, it did not sound natural in any capacity. I probably jumped five feet in the air when I heard it, and my brother shouted a few choice curses before shooing me quickly to the exit of the tunnel. At this point, my brother decided we should just continue walking and head back after whatever made the noise hopefully cleared out. We didn't have any firearms on us, so I was pretty upset. 
My brother reassured me we would be fine, and we made the walk back without incident. However, I didn't get any sleep that night. Whether it was the thing that screeched at us, or just my imagination, I heard things moving around the campsite the whole night, as well as whispers echoing through the darkness outside the trailer. I woke my brother up a few times to check out what it was, but he refused each time, telling me that it was probably just other campers staying up late and enjoying themselves. The rest of the trip was pretty normal. We packed up the following day, and my life continued as normal. I was disconcerted, but chalked what happened up as a harmless event that I must have been exaggerating in retrospect. A few weeks later, I went up to Pine Basin, an old ski lodge my family rented each year for family reunions. Here I would mess around with my cousins, our favorite activities being night games. We would play hide-and-seek, a game called Ghosts in the Graveyard, and other games like that. In one instance, I was chosen to be the seeker for a hide, and eat game. Because I was one of the younger cousins, I got a flashlight as an advantage. Normally, all the younger cousins hid close to the lodge, and the older cousins hid in the trees or at the base of the nearby mountain. As I was searching near the bottom of the mountain, I heard a familiar whistle up the mountain a bit. We would always whistle as a hint at our location. It sounded like someone was hiding way up near a tree known as the underwear tree. You can guess why. So I began trekking up toward the whistle. As I climbed closer, I got an uneasy feeling in my stomach. I continued on warily and convinced myself that I would be fine. I hated walking in the night alone, but figured whoever I find would walk me back to the lodge. As I neared the tree, I noticed that it was deathly silent. This alerted me that something was very wrong, because you could always hear the adults having fun back at the lodge. I was anxious to hurry back, so I called out. I found you, Scott. I thought the whistle was my older cousin's. Come back down with me. I got no reply, but I wasn't planning on waiting. As I began walking back down the path, I heard a voice call you almost had me. So I ran back up to investigate. I flashed my light in the branches of the tree and saw a monstrosity that was not my cousin. It looked like a poorly drawn stick figure made into a human with its emaciated figure and lifeless eyes. I remember its face looked like the skin on its head was being pulled from behind. It had torn and stretched features. As soon as I saw the creature, I screamed, dropped the flashlight, and ran back to the lodge. The entire time I ran, I was overcome by an overpowering smell, and I could hear the thing running after me. As I approached the camp, I saw a few people my cousins, at the bottom of the mountain, waiting for me. I was crying and shaking, and they took me inside. I told my dad what happened, but my cousins all said they didn't see anything following me. The adults kept us inside for the night, and I kept hearing sounds drifting in from the mountains. I never played night games after that happened, and was always terrified that my cousins wouldn't listen to my warnings. Ever since that night, I have always felt uneasy up in those mountains. I used to be really religious and figured it was a demon of some kind trying to kill me or something like that. But those mountains have never felt the same after that incident. A few years ago, the game Until Dawn became really popular and I watched a walkthrough of it on YouTube. When the Wendigo first appeared in the game, I got chills down my spine. It was exactly what I saw, and I did a ton of research on them. I figure someone must have gotten snowed in at that old lodge and resorted to cannibalism, but that doesn't explain what happened at Warm River. I still hear that screech from time to time. It never occurred to me until watching until dawn that they might be from the same thing, and it scares the hell out of me every time. I heard it earlier tonight, and that's why I decided to finally write my story down. When I was 16, I went out with my friends, Jay and Harley, to a large park with a lake and massive grass hills. It was already dark since it was winter, and we sat down to talk after finishing school. We were situated on a hill with a forest to our right and thick grass bushes behind us. 
While we were chatting, Jay, who was the loud one in our group, started whistling and shouting due to the echo it created. Suddenly, we all heard the same whistle back at us from behind the bushes. We were confused because we knew it. It couldn't have been the echo. Jay shouted at the sound to provoke it, which frightened me. After a while, something screamed back at us, faint but clear, making my heart drop. Jay then suggested we go investigate, and we followed him. As we walked closer to the bushes, we strayed off towards the exit passage, telling him we should leave. However, he claimed to see eyes and something darted at him. We all ran through the passage, and Jay was screaming while me and Harley were in disbelief. Once we reached the road, we looked back and shouted Jay's name. After five minutes, he stumbled out of the darkness and fell to our feet. We walked away from there as fast as we could, not talking about what had happened. The next day, we met up again and found out that Jay was covered in black and yellow bruises. I have no evidence to prove this story, but I wanted to share it nonetheless. In this case, it's not something I saw, but something I didn't see. Girlfriend and I were in the Tetons last summer when we had to make a pit stop near the end of our week-long camping trip. We turned into the Spread Creek campground area to get away from the traffic on the main road going towards Jackson. We found out later that our discreet pea spot was only 25 yards away from where Gabby Petito's body was eventually discovered. This was only a day after she was last heard from again, so she was likely already laying there. Felt horrible and helpless to learn what happened to her, after the fact especially since we were only a stone's throw away. So I was hiking in north-central Pa Forest country with my girlfriend. Weekend hike, like 30 miles. In the middle of an absolutely black, moonless night, I couldn't sleep. She was lightly sleeping next to me. I was lying there listening to the sounds of the woods with my eyes open or closed. It was the same either way. Then, I saw a light moving in the distance through the Cuban mesh tent fabric. It was a small, dim light that looked like a flashlight being carried. I thought it might be a park ranger. I see those guys from time to time. I thought it might be a night hiker. I do that sometimes. I had no idea what it was, but I was absolutely certain it was headed towards us. The light followed a roughly wave-shaped path through the trees, meandering slowly in our direction. I called out to it and woke up my girlfriend. I shouted, hey, and stuff like that. I verified with her that we were both awake and both seeing the same thing. It moved silently. There is no question that whatever it is, it knows we are there and absolutely is coming over to inspect us. I was freaking out a little, shouting, go away, she yelled at it. I was too chicken shit to unzip the tent and confront it. I'm not kidding you. I was terrified. The light approached the tent, did a circle around us, and left the way out came, floating up and down, snaking its way back into the forest without a sound. We were completely shaken by the experience, but it was over and we had zero answers. After the hike, we asked the rangers at the station if anyone had reported seeing floating lights, but they just looked at us like we were high, sober as a judge the whole trip. For two years, I sat with that experience in my brain, until it happened again. Same girlfriend, same tent, same time of night, different forest, still north central pie. Same kind of weekend, loop hike. We saw it again. Through the thin fabric of our tent, the light was blurry but unmistakable. And again, it floated towards us, up and down. Then it made contact. It landed on the tent. It was a firefly. It had always been a firefly. Sometimes fireflies leave their butts on for extended periods of time when they're lost in searching for others. My tent had reflectors on the zippers and lines. The bugs saw their own reflection and came to investigate. For two years, I thought I had seen the supernatural.
One night in the summer, when I was about ten or eleven, I was awake in the middle of the night, and I could hear the horses running around the pasture as if something had happened. I decided to get up and go check on things. At that time, my family had a massive old barn, and we lived in the middle of nowhere. I walked through the door of the barn and found a very large man, as white as snow, climbing into the hayloft. I remember being startled, but not scared. He turned around, looked at me, and slowly lowered himself back. He took a few steps before he knelt down and put out his hand, like one would do with a stray animal. As I looked at him, I felt like he looked sad and tired, and not at all like he would do me any harm. I decided to take his hand and walk him toward our kids' hangout space, which was just a space in the barn where we had some old couches, a few toys, and a radio. As soon as he saw the radio, he became more animated, ran towards it, and started messing around with it. That went on for a bit, and I kept asking him what he needed the radio for. He never said a word. Not one word. He wouldn't give me a name, so I started calling him Radio. After some time, he set the radio down and sat down on the couch. I brought over my favorite horse book and started thumbing through the pages, showing him all of my favorite horse breed. Eventually, he gently took the book from me and closed it as if to say, I'm done. I got up to put the book away, and he lay down on the couch. I remember him being so large that his head was on the armrest, while his legs hung over the other armrest at the knee. He was a giant, pure white, and I don't recall any hair. His eyes were jet black, but they weren't huge or angular. If anything, they slanted downward and were beady. After he fell asleep, I decided to go back in the house and go to bed, but I put a blanket over him before I went in. I woke up in the morning, and the whole experience came flooding back to me. My feet were dirty as if I had been outside during the night. I grabbed some snacks and ran out to the barn. I ran to our hangout space and found everything as I would have expected it. The blanket was on the floor. The book was sitting on the table, and the radio was out of place. But he was gone. It's important to know that I had a habit of sleepwalking at this time in my life, so it's possible that this was all just a dream. At first I thought he was just a very strange person, and I hoped he found safety. The memory never left me, and by the time I was a teen, I had decided that I'd dream the whole thing and let it go. Then the film Prometheus came out, and I agreed to go see it with friends. When the tall white alien came on the screen, I nearly jumped out of my seat. It wasn't an exact likeness, but it was like seeing a ghost. At the time, I knew absolutely nothing about aliens, and the only one I had ever heard of was the classic little green men. Nonetheless, I forced myself to let it go and move on. That memory could not be real, so I must have dreamed it. As time passed, I started wondering how I could have imagined a being that I had never heard of. Could that have really happened? Could radio be real? Has anyone else had an experience like this? Me, Glenn, and our friends Larry and Katrina were camping near the Malala site two years ago on March 2, 1996. But we were further down Copper Creek Road, about five, six miles away. We set up camp at an old gravel pit with a creek behind it, and it was right next to the road. At around 10, 11 p.m., we heard a loud scream coming from down in the canyon. It was so loud it made the hairs on the back of our neck stand up. Later that night, we heard another scream, but this one was closer. We were so scared that we all stayed in the truck that night. At around 2 a.m., our dog, who was tied to a nearby tree, started to go crazy and tried to get into the truck with us. We then heard two thuds which sounded really close, like a big limb breaking and hitting the ground. It was so terrifying that we couldn't go back to sleep for the rest of the night. The next night, we moved to a new locality at the end of a dead-end road nearby. This time, we saw something even more strange. There were lights hovering over the trees, lighting them up. The lights were just above tree height and made no sounds. We all stood there in awe, trying to figure out what we were seeing. 
It was like nothing we had ever seen before. We stayed up for the rest of the night, afraid to close our eyes and miss anything. We never did figure out what was causing all of the strange occurrences during that camping trip. It's something that still haunts me to this day. My brother-in-law and I were bow hunting in the Deschutes National Forest. There are endless amounts of dirt forest service roads throughout the central Oregon region. We would drive down these roads and find a promising spot, get out and walk the area. There are a lot of old fire areas and we found one we had not been to before it was a burnt out section of forest, approximately 1,500 acres in size located about two or three miles from the base of Paulina Peak and Newberry Crater and about one mile in from Highway 30, one and about one mile in from a dirt power line road and on the southwest section of the fire. The burned area was very wide open and we were near some small rock outcrops. There was a cat line road around the fire and this is what we parked on. It was approximately one and we had no luck so we decided to try one last place and then go home for the day, which is where I have described. We parked and got out quietly, and I headed into the woods on the other side of the road. I walked about 100 feet in and was startled by a dow jumping out of the brush and fleeing. We decided to go in the direction that the dow had gone thinking that there may be a buck somewhere nearby. My brother-in-law went off in the direction she thought the dow had gone, and I stayed back and looked for tracks to see if there was others. This is when I noticed some very strange prints on the ground. They were like a human's footprint, but larger. There were about 8 to 12 prints by one creature. As far as I could tell, the prints were not all in one direction. It looked as if the creature, animal, or whatever may have shifted its weight, or something when it turned, because the dirt was pushed up more on the outside of the print in places. I told my partner, and he didn't seem to be interested, he just kept looking for the deer. Then he finally came back up over the little rise, and I showed him the tracks. He didn't seem to know what to think. I kept studying them and tried to come up with an answer for them. I thought maybe the wind, but no, the chances of the wind making one, let alone eight, twelve of the prints, was very unlikely. Or rain, but there is no way. Or a bear, but for a bear to be on its hind legs and to take that many steps was very, very unlikely. The prints, from what I remember, were about 12 to 15 inches in size, and some of the strides were possibly four to four and a one-half feet. We had been at this location for about 30 minutes when my brother-in-law said we should go. He sounded kind of shaky which was very unusual for him. I asked him why, and he said we should go. So this got me kind of spooked for the first during this half hour. So we got in the car and left. We never saw a creature or heard any unusual sounds. Other than the prints, the only thing that seemed odd to me was that when we first got to this location is that it was very quiet. I've spent more than my share of time alone in the woods, but one occasion definitely stands out as the creepiest thing I've experienced while no one else was around. I have a friend that has 40 acres outside of town that he has slowly converted into a subsistence farm for his family. Years ago, when he mostly only had a dozen or so chickens out there, I spent a few months living on the property in a tent while I was between seasonal work. At the time, the property was decades, neglected, overgrown pasture land with a few clumps of denser woods. I had set up my tent and homestead right in the middle of the property in a small clear area between two densely wooded thickets. My friend would come by once a day to feed the animals, but other than that, there was zero chance of me seeing another human unless I left the property. I really enjoyed the solitude and had taken to observing nature in a way that I had never really done before. When the incident occurred, I had been living out there for about two months, so I was well used to the sounds of nature outside my tent at night. 
I had gotten to the point where I wouldn't even bother to get out of the tent and look if I heard a small animal walking past my tent at night. I would even gotten used to the sound that the roof of the pump house made when wind blew hard from the southeast. My friend had been short on nails when he was building the roof over the pump, so the southeast corner wasn't nailed down, and a strong wind would cause the corner of the corrugated metal roof to peel up, and then crash down loudly when the wind stopped. It was about 200 feet away from my tent, so it had caused me to jump a bit when I first moved out there, but within a month it had just become another sound outside my tent at, at night. It was even sort of comforting like some people that live in big cities say that they can't sleep without the sound of traffic outside their window. It probably helped that the sound was always paired with the sound of wind blowing through the trees. So one night I'm tucked in my sleeping bag, starting to drift off when I hear the shed corner come crashing down. Nothing to worry about. I probably didn't even open my eyes. But then I hear what sounds like a person mimicking the sound the shed had made. Right outside my tent, my blood freezes in my veins and my eyes open wide in the darkness, and I hold perfectly still. I know that my friend has already come and gone hours before. I am alone on a piece of land that is large enough that there is no reason for a person to accidentally end up next to my tent in the middle of the night. After a few moments, the wind makes the shed roof crash again. And again, I heard a person mimic the crashing sound a few seconds later. I called out and asked if there was anyone there. No response. The shed roof crashed a third time, but this time there was no mimicking sound. So I am out of my sleeping bag and out of my tent, flashlight in one hand, camp knife in the other. I shine my flashlight right where the fake crashing sound seemed to come from. Nothing. It's the edge of the woods, but the sound had been close, and I can see you through the brush well enough to tell that there isn't a person hiding behind the bushes and low branches. I'm looking at the ground, and none of the dead leaves look particularly disturbed. I'm trying to figure out how far someone could have moved at a slow enough pace to not make enough sound for me to hear their footsteps on the leaf litter. Answer, not very far, when the shed roof crashes again and I hear the same fake crash sound again, right next to me, where I am 100% positive there isn't a person standing. At this point, my heart is beating a mile a minute, and I am getting ready to believe in the supernatural. While sweeping my flashlight beam through the human free spot, the sound seemed to be coming from. I see a bird. It's sitting in the low branches of a tree at about head height, I stop moving the flashlight and keep the beam on the bird for a moment. The bird opens its mouth and makes the fake crashing sound. Oh, and the little guy stuck around for another month making the same sound, so I eventually got used to his sound at night as well, but I resented it every time I heard it. This happened in 2021 when me and three of my friends decided to go out late at night to go for a walk through a forest in Mission, British Columbia, to a small lake in late at night. We were at the bushes before the train tracks, and we were standing there, contemplating whether it was a good idea or not to move forward with going into the forest, past the train tracks. For some reason, we stood there, and two of my friends felt uncomfortable that we were going to go in, while my other friend and I were feeling adventurous and all up for the walk. So we stood there, and we were like, why don't you guys want to go in? And you could just tell they felt uncomfortable and wanted to leave. So we waited a bit longer. Then both me and my other friend felt uncomfortable, and we decided it's not a good idea that we go. Then we heard a branch snap in the bushes a couple feet away from us, like something stepped on it, but there was no other sound. It was completely silent. It wasn't a small branch either, it was a thick one. It wasn't just a snap, it was a snap. No sound of bushes moving or any movement, like something was still in the bushes watching us. So we all decided it was no good felt we were being observed by something or someone that could possibly be dangerous. And we took off back to the truck immediately and left, 
probably just an animal, but still, who wants to take the risk of being stalked or mauled by an animal who was potentially observing you as a group. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.